Hello, everyone. Welcome to you. Ask Me Field Anything. I'm going to wait a few minutes before we get started here and let people log in. And I will start just after um, we wait a couple minutes. While we're sitting here waiting, I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with Zoom by this point. But just in case you need a little reminder, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or wherever your menu bar pops up. Um, go ahead and use that to submit questions live for us. And we will also be using the chat feature to include any links while we're talking about a few things. We might share some information, blog posts, things like that. And we'll be putting the links into the chat section. So questions and Q&A, comments in chat, and let us know um, if you have any comments. We're gonna start off going through the topic for today and then we'll get to questions later in the session. And let's go ahead and get started. So welcome again. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning on Ask Me Field Anything. This is a monthly live Q&A session on technical topics. And our goal is really to just provide a space to answer your questions live and also dive into some topics and, and bring some other subject matter experts um, on the session. And I'm gonna take a pause right here to make sure I'm recording this. And... So it is. Okay, great. Um, okay, so our topic today is PV system design for difficult roofs. And Mayfield Renewables does PV system design for both PV and storage. We have extensive experience in this and also do design consulting and training. We happen to also do technical services. Um, and that includes white papers, presentations, competitive product research. Uh, as well as we're starting to launch a new education series, which I'll tell you a little bit more about at the very end of this. Um, if you want to know more about Mayfield Renewables, check out our website, mayfield.energy, or reach out to us directly, myself, Jennifer, or Ryan. And with that, my name is Jennifer Halfson. I am the Director of Business Development at Mayfield Renewables been in the industry since 2011. My background's as a mechanical engineer. I've worked as a R&D, uh, actually I used to design roof mounts for quick mount PV back in the day, which is now Iron Ridge, which is so weird because <laughs> for the longest time we were rivals and now those two companies merge. So that's super interesting. And my wonderful, wonderful boss and the president, our founder and CEO of Mayfield Renewables is here as well, Ryan Mayfield. Uh, welcome, Ryan, and good morning. Yeah, thanks for letting me come on. Or I guess good <laughs> midday. It's good afternoon. Right afternoon. Yeah, this afternoon, <laughs> technically this here. This is a PM now. And uh, our guests today are Kate Collardson with Baywa. So Kate is a total badass in the industry. She works as a product manager at Baywa Solar Systems, who has filled many roles in her career during the solar industry. After entering the industry as an installer in 2006, she moved on to positions including designer, permit tech, trainer, technical support, and program manager. Kate is known as a passionate advocate for sustainability. She holds a NAPSET PV installation professional credential and currently serves as chair of the sustainability advisory board for the city of Longmont, Colorado. Kate has a BA in German from Colorado College <laughs> and an MBA with a certificate in sustainable technology from Arizona State University. Welcome, Kate, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And, and Kate, I, I just like... learned about the German thing, so I'm feeling um, a little giddy about that. So, <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll be sure and talk to you about that one later. It sounds good. Yeah, maybe you can give us a little <laughs> German lesson. I feel like that should be a game of let's let's talk about someone's 
work experience and their background in the industry and then guess their major. <laughs> <laughs> a good game. <laughs> Love that. Those 50 50 is going to have nothing to do with what they do. And our other guest today, who is also a certified badass in the industry, Emily Wang, leads the applications engineering team at Yaskawa Selectria Solar and is the PVI product line manager. She brings over 10 years of experience in the solar industry, working as a design engineer, product manager, and applications engineer for off-grid to megawatt grid connected installations. Emily holds a BSc in electrical engineering and an MSc in telecommunications and networking from the University of Pennsylvania and is a NAPSEP certified PV installation professional. Welcome, Emily, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Really excited to be here. Yeah. All right, so getting into our topic for today, tips for PV system design on difficult roofs. And when we say difficult roofs, really we're talking about oddly shaped roofs, if they're heavily shaded or more commonly covered with obstructions, whether it's skylights, vents, or some other crazy stuff that happens to show up on a roof. And that can make accessibility really difficult, just physically getting onto the roof and walking around it. We actually wrote a blog post on the uh, on our website on Mayfield.energy. You can find that and we go through some tips for designing systems on roofs like these. And We'll put the link in the chat box right now. So if you wanted to go in and, and nerd out on that later, feel free to do that. Uh, but we're gonna go over some of the high level things during this Q and A right now. But first off, I just am curious, what are some of the difficult roofs that, that you all have encountered in your experience? Um, I, I'll jump on that one, I'll go first. Um... Yeah, there's been numerous uh, difficult roofs. Um, you know, the we're we're in the northwest. We're you know based in uh, Oregon, and so um, it's interesting. We have I think we'll talk a little bit about this later. Um, city of Portland. Um, for those of you that haven't had the joy of working in that jurisdiction, um, they make any roof difficult roof. Um, hopefully, there's not a bunch of city of Portland people on this call, and I just alienated myself. Um, but nonetheless, um, the, the, there's a few that come to mind and we were talking about this earlier. And um, one of the ones that actually comes to mind first and foremost is, and it wasn't even the roof that was the difficulty, um, but it was a difficult site, I guess you could say. And one of the things that came up uh, was um, there was a single location. So it was a multi-story building, it was a six-story building a single location it was uh, actually on a college campus and so there's a single location where they could lift stuff from the ground level up to the roof uh, and that one location happened to be right over a tunnel that went between buildings um, on campus and and so that was that in of itself was this difficulty um, the roof was also very difficult um, uh, for its own reasons but uh, that one was one that like always jumps to mind when we talk about that and it so it's one of those things like we're talking about roofs specifically um, but then you also have to just think about everything that you, know, you have to take into the the, the whole view of, of how you're going to get things up um, and the whole reason that topic came up was because we were talking about point loading on the roof how we were going to store the materials on the roof uh, where they were going to lift it up um, and so that's how that whole discussion came up otherwise i think nobody on the team would have caught that so thank goodness that it was brought up Great. What other have you guys, Emily or Kate, have you encountered some unexpected or really crazy roofs or situations? Sure. Um, so, so I've I've worked on um, some some crazy roofs, I guess, on the other side of the coast um, in New York City. You are required. I mean, think about it. All these skyscrapers, you have really high um, installations, and um, you have to think about how to lift them safely with all those people around. Um, as well, I mean, obviously the, the point loading, the standing seam roofs are always something that, that um, require uh, very intricate engineering um, analysis. Um, 
And the hard to access roofs are, are the ones that, that are the most interesting for me uh, because they require the most planning, um, knowing how to stage everything, um, timing everything so that things will be right um, and making sure that everyone knows the safety measures um, that go into difficult roofs. Um, as well, my there's one roof that is like my, the thorn in my heel um, at, where we measured the roof rafters, but some of the rafters were hidden. And we had assumed that because all the roof rafters that we saw were of regular distance from each other, um, that it would continue on. And uh, during installation, uh, that was not the case, actually, um, which required a huge rework, um, pretty much a sleepless night uh, in order for that to happen. Um, you know, not impossible, but but some things that, you know, lesson learned, make sure that you check off all the roof rafters. Do not assume that roof rafters are of equal lengths all the time. Yeah, that's a great tip. Yeah, I've, I've been in that situation too. That is sage advice. <laughs> you definitely want to check all of the rafters and uh, don't make assumptions on I you know sometimes you have to say no uh, sometimes I, I've I've been on a roof um, the, the the first that pops to mind is is a roof in in Paonia Colorado we we're uh, uh, looking at installing a, a system on a one of the buildings downtown and uh, we we got up on the the roof and there I there simply wasn't room. There were three huge skylights and uh, an HVAC unit in addition to radio, like satellite dishes, multiple. And in the end, you you couldn't fit enough PV up there to, to do anything with. So, and that, that's a situation where I just said, no, this, is, this isn't gonna work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that brings um, up a great point. So are you guys seeing the picture of the roof now again? Yeah. I just switched my screen sharing. I figured I was going to try to show your guys' faces as much as possible instead of a photo. So that actually kind of leads really well into our first question, which is when you're designing a PV system, how on a difficult roof, and you have an idea there are gonna be some issues, where should a designer or developer start? What would be the most helpful? And maybe Ryan, you can take this question. Yeah, sure. And this is actually a roof that I, I I've been on uh, and this one, was, um, this one was interesting and a challenge and it doesn't, maybe from this picture, it doesn't look quite as bad as it really was. Um, but one of the things, you know, I think as designers, one of the things we're always quick to do is do, a, you know, a, um, uh, a desk audit or a desk um, review of the of the roof and the site. Uh, but one of the, you know, especially on difficult roofs, you know, the biggest one of the biggest keys is getting on the roof and actually just verifying everything. And just you're not going to see certain things. There's, you know, from a satellite view, you're probably not going to see some of those pipes, um, some of those vent pipes that you're seeing in this picture, for example, is probably not going to show up. Um, and so it's just real easy to, I think, get misled um, on on the roof itself. And so the the other thing, uh, and this is a great example of this. This was a um, school, and this was a campus where the original building was built in like 1921. They did a you know add on. They just kind of just kept growing this school, and so there's these different sections of building and different section of roof um, under various time frames, um, And so it's just a matter of coordinating what that is. What are those structural, uh, the structural capabilities of the, of each roof section um, in, as you're going along. And so for me, yeah, I think just reiterating the getting on site and, and just really verifying what's going on there um, and to Emily's point earlier, the structural analysis, um, trying to, to determine what that is as best you can. And, and part of the problem with that as a you know, site, on a site visit, you know, typically you're not gonna be bringing out the structural engineer. Uh, so you're not gonna have an exact um, 
knowledge of what the what the structural capabilities are but if you can get views like this you know we have a couple of pictures here where you can get some really good views of what that structural what what the structure from the underneath looks like um, that's also like super critical information to to try and gather um, so that you can one when you the other thing that you're always going to ask for is the as built uh, for the building itself hopefully they exist um, but then comparing that to what's on paper versus what's actually there uh, is is a really important thing. Yeah, and that I remember actually when we were looking at this roof initially when we were looking at the satellite image and I don't know if you can how well you can see this, but if you look on there's these are basically three different buildings kind of attached to each other right. and there's this one has a funky slope to it. Yeah, way and it's more actually, than the, this one does. And you couldn't yeah. tell that from the satellite right. image. Like and you, the only even, way we realized that was on the, yeah, yeah. when you got <laughs> up on the roof. And even in this picture, it probably doesn't even give it quite the justice because there is, it's a, there's a peak in the middle and then it goes, it has four different slopes. Um, so there's a ridge going east, west and a ridge going north, south. So it's almost like this trapezoid kind of. And so, yeah, so you're, you look at that and think, oh, this is a, look at that on a satellite image. That's a beautiful, potential for, um, for a ballasted system maybe, but now you have four different angles that you're working with and is the slope of that racking system really gonna work? So there's just a lot of unknowns with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with NEC, moving on to the next question, with NEC 2017 requiring module level rap rapid shutdown, uh, when you're choosing and locating components, what should be considered? And I think this might be a good question for you, Emily. Sure. Um, so if, if you're online and you're uh, part of the 35 states, if you're doing a project in one of the 35 states that requires either NEC 2017 or 2020, um, you're, you're going to need to comply with module level rapid shutdown. Um, it's NEC 690.12B2, and um, that states that um, all the controlled conductors located inside the boundary of not more than one meter uh, from point of penetration of the surface of the building shall be limited to not more than 80 volts within 30 seconds of rapid shutdown initiation, and that the voltages need to be, um, shall be measured between any two conductors and between any conductor and ground. So, so that's actually verbatim what the NEC code says. So when you're trying to comply with this, you have a few options and the easiest, most cost-effective and um, robust method is to choose a very simple module level power electronic that's gonna only perform the rapid shutdown command. Um, and this can be currently found in the market as a one per one, uh, so it's one unit per one module or um, a one unit per two modules uh, or a one unit per four um, PV modules set up. Um, other than that, you can also go with an option of optimizers or microinverters to satisfy this requirement. Uh, so that's the first decision you have to make as a designer is um, what functionalities do you want to put in your module level power electronics? And you have to remember that the more electronics and the more functionality you have, um, in a system, it's going to become more complex and there's going to be more points of failure. Um, so on difficult roofs that are hard to access for O&M, uh, it might benefit you to limit the um, points of failure, um, the complexity of the system. And um, you, you might want to just basically comply with NEC. Um, other things to consider when choosing your MLPE is how you're going to communicate with it. Um, do you want to use wireless communications um, or have extra wiring on site? Or if you wanna go with power line communications. Um, and a lot of people don't know the background of SunSpec Alliance. And SunSpec Alliance um, is a nonprofit uh, that has made a standard. They've worked with the module level power electronics community and um, the inverter um, community to um, come up with a standard of shutting down and complying with the NEC code. And the standard actually allows for, um, basically it requires the transmitter to fail in a safe mode if the communication 
um, goes awry. Uh, there are other things the center says, but I think that for me, that is the, the crux of why they made this standard. Uh, but something to keep in mind, even though all this, if, it, if they say they're sunspec rapid shutdown compliant, it doesn't mean that you can willy nilly use one brand of transmitter with another brand of receiver. Um, that doesn't mm -hmm. always work. Um, the, the, the companies will not possibly will not honor that warranty. Um, and uh, there are two types of certifications that you have to keep in mind when thinking of module level rapid shutdown. Um, it's the PV rapid shutdown equipment um, part of things. So the MLP that you use according to the NEC has to be listed. Um, and, and that's part of a UL 1741. Um, as well, um, the module level equipment has to be tested with your inverter. So um, that, that's considered the PV rapid shutdown systems listing. Um, that's also part of UL 1741 essay. And um, that just assures that your whole system will shut down within the required amount of time. Uh, but that, what that doesn't mean, unfortunately, is that the two components are guaranteed to work together 100%. Um, UL only, uh, only tests for uh, shutting down to the required voltage and required, at the required time um, right now. And um, they don't check for compatibility. It just has to work for that test. Um, so things like arc faults are um, stuff that they don't check for. So when you are choosing your components, um, even if they have the PVRSS listing, I would recommend uh, talking with the inverter manufacturer and also the module level power electronics manufacturer and ensuring that they both feel that um, the, this system is compatible and will be under warranty. Mm -hmm. Well, and that probably also ties into, and maybe this is a, a, a totally different bomb to throw in here, but with the connector mateability, right? I mean, that enter, brings Absolutely. up a whole nother element of risk of whether or not the connectors are going to, are the actual same exact brand and, and model. Yeah, exactly. I mean, listings are, it, it makes you feel very warm and cozy inside, but if, if it's not if the brands are not compatible, um, they haven't UL listed together. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so you have that possibility of um, incompatibility that could lead to thermal events, as we call it. Yeah, yeah, that's great. A uh, lot of things to keep in mind there. So, actually, so, I want to I want to jump in real quick. Because yeah, we actually had this, um, is, and it wasn't the the fault of the roof. It was uh, something that came around and bit us in the ass. Uh, and we had the, exactly that incompatibility uh, between the components. And so on the, you know, on the getting the fix going. Um, so now, now, you know, to your point, Emily, you're saying talk to both parties to make sure. Um, I guess, how does that, it, from the inverters manufacturer perspective, is that, I guess, how does that really work? Is it the inverter manufacturer that's Work trying to work with all the MLPEs, or are the, all the MLPEs trying to make sure that they're compatible with the inverters. How does kind of how does that marriage come to be? I guess I don't. I guess my question is, you know, how do you, how do we know as a designer um, the the best way or the maybe the best possible products that are compatible with each other? And I'm totally. I know, I know I'm kind of coming out of left field here, but it just when as we were talking about it, it made me. Um, made me think of this project that we actually had that um, was kind of like, oh, crap, um, where, where it just didn't work out. Yeah, um, that, that's always unfortunate because the more module, like the more components you have in a system, the more you have to um, be able to communicate with each individual right. party. Um, and, and that's, I think that's the, the most important part of this whole thing being having that communication, it's not assuming that it's going to work. Sure. Um, I, I mean, and it also might work, but just <laughs> not assuming right. before you design something together um, is really important. I mean, because we we have things that are um, that are uh, compatible with um, certain products, but only if you use a certain firmware, right? And then like that that thing might not be oh, um, super out there and okay. easy to access. Yeah. 
So, so the big takeaway is just verify with both sides that they're going to work together. Absolutely. Got it. Good takeaway. So do the due diligence, reach out to the equipment manufacturers and get that info. So uh, module level electronics or electronic components is one factor. And a lot of times on these tricky roofs, it's really more about the physical layout of the roof that gets super complicated. So what about racking selection for a funky roof? And Kate, maybe you can take this one. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the the racking that's out there um, for these types of flat roofs is is modular. So you can you, you can set it up to in a way that, and you can see this is a great example. The the image that you're showing, if you if you need to to have cutouts for. Um, uh, skylights or roof vents or that sort of thing you you can easily design that with some of the the more modular um, racking systems that um, you, you kind of put down uh, the rack and it, it accepts a module and then um, you know that you design it that way you kind of stack it across the roof um, so that's that's really the easiest way to uh, to to design around obstacles is to find a, a racking system that allows you to really easily. Uh, Unirac makes a couple of, of, uh, of options there. Yeah. And um, uh, actually one of the live questions that just came in from Drew Gillette asked, mm -hmm. have you thought about modifying roof obstructions to increase the percentage covered by PV? So basically opening up the roof more to allow for additional modules to get installed. Uh, for example, chopping off pipes, moving vents, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that is, uh, <laughs> I've definitely considered that, and <laughs> I, I may or may not have done it in the past. Um, chopping off of pipes, I, I the uh, what I've learned is that a lot of times the height of uh, the pipe is set by code, and so if you're in a snow area, and um, then that pipe is high enough to stay above the snow, and if you chop it off, then it's not going to be. Um, but another thing that I've learned uh, in my career is that moving a vent is is a pretty easy thing if you have a roofer there. If you're if you're working with a roofer, if you're starting with a um, a, a bare deck, it's especially easy to to just cut a hole in a different place in the roof and uh, and move the pipe uh, to that section of the roof. I, it's it, I was amazed when I figured out how easy it is to, to actually do that. <laughs> hmm. And something, yeah, that, oh, go ahead, say, Ryan. Some, something we've seen too. So pipes, um, just echoing what Kate said there. And then something that we've run across quite a bit, and it's not showing in this picture, but uh, are uh, like gas lines to HVAC units or um, you know other rooftop units. And so sometimes, you know, when they installed those, they put the gas line in what made the most sense for them at the time. They weren't trying to think of trying to keep this nice wide open space for future PV. Um, so being able to re reroute those is all, it should be an option. Um, you know, not every time you're doing more work on a roof, obviously it costs more money, but uh, there are ways of you know, rerouting that. So just because you see a pipe traversing right through your nice wide open section of roof doesn't mean it's not off limits anymore. Yeah, that's good to know. And also, if you have the opportunity to work with a building owner and say they're about to do a re-roof and they're going to replace the roof anyways, then that's a perfect opportunity to maybe move some vents around or, or make open up some space or maybe even get rid of a skylight if you can and um, allow some additional space. So when you're scoping and designing the project, um, what are some of the tips for setting realistic customer expectations? And Ryan, maybe this one sure. for you. Yeah, so you know, the, the approach that we very often take is um, being a little more, more conservative on the layout. Um, 
one of the things uh, that we've seen, tr you know, trying to, you have a difficult roof typically means that you're space constrained. So you're trying to make the system as large as possible. Of course, everybody wants the biggest PV system they possibly can get. Um, but if you are kind of cramming in, shoehorning in these modules, um, part of the problem is when you get to construction and I'm sure everybody on the call involved in construction knows that stuff happens on a construction site and you have to make changes on the fly. Uh, if you have shoehorned in every square inch of that roof and you're trying to put modules in and all of a sudden you can't fit a module somewhere, you have nowhere else to relocate it. Um, and so giving yourself some outs, quite honestly, uh, just giving yourself some bigger buffer zones around HVAC units, just trying to make it think about, um, you know, future folks up on that roof, not just O&M on the PV array, um, but just thinking about other folks that are gonna be uh, any HVAC techs or anything like that, they're gonna be up on the roof. So that's always our, I would say our, our big thing is be a little more conservative, give yourself some outs, um, you know, taking away 10, 12, depending on the size of the roof, you know, a few modules. Yeah, it does make the system size smaller, but it's gonna make your life a heck of a lot easier. And, you know, in the end, it's not that much of a, you know, smaller system. Mm -hmm. Well, I can definitely second that having been an applications engineer at SunPower and I was supporting their Helix ballasted system. And we would have the SunPower dealers would uh, reach out to us for their preliminary designs. And so we would be working off the satellite images and, you know, they're fuzzy and you can't really tell, like, is that a vent? Is that just like a mold spot? I, don't have, I can't tell. And so we would place the modules in there and we'd tell them, okay, but you, you need to do a site visit. You have to go verify where this stuff is. And then they would inevitably, they would always be asking me to add modules to their design layout, to the proposal layout at the sales stage. And I kept telling them like, no, you're not gonna be able to fit this on there. Like you, it's not gonna work. You're gonna run into issues. And then lo and behold, two, three months later, they'd be like, oh my God, we have to relocate this and be scrambling to deal with it. So yeah, definitely yep. create some buffer space. Yeah. And um, and the other thing that ahead. I would I uh, just real quickly don't don't need to totally dominate but the the um, the other thing to Emily's point earlier about the module level power electronics and what your choices are I mean we do have a lot of choices now and so previously we would be very reticent to have like well, you know kind of these individual modules is call it a ballast if you're doing a ballasted system and having this not individual module off on an island all by itself but maybe you know one module. Um, another row up or something, um, you know, with the ability to have these module of a power electronics gives us a little more flexibility. Um, so that's the other part of like giving yourself some outs. Uh, if you're using module level power electronics that are optimizers uh, or something to that effect, um, you do have the ability to on the fly, maybe move some modules around uh, and, and not totally screw up your, your stringing. So. Hmm. It's good to know. So with that, and just a reminder to everyone that's on the line, we are answering questions live. It really helps if you use the Q&A thing instead of chat so that we keep track of which questions we've already answered. Um, so go ahead and, and submit your questions via the Q&A. Uh, I see one that came in from Bob Soldier, um, actually related to this topic of pipes. So what is the best practice for setbacks from gas pipes? I would say three feet, um, just kind of a, using NEC standards for setbacks, dedicated, equipment, dedicated space, those kinds of things. I mean, we are talking about equipment of different systems. Um, so that would be, you know, without knowing anything else, I would just say, you know, three feet. Um, of course, <laughs> as with anything in code, uh, things could, can vary. Mm -hmm. And so staying on the topic of, of design, is there an industry, and this question just came in from Hamilton Hutchinson. Thanks for joining us. And thanks for submitting questions. Is there an industry standard for what shading window to consider? Like winter solstice from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. 
without doing the ROI analysis every single time. I have an opinion, but <laughs> Kate and Emily, <laughs> do you want to say anything? I, nine to three is is what I was always taught to use. Yeah. Um, is that what's your opinion, Ryan? Um, well, I've actually done a fair amount of looking at this, and it's again, it's being very northwest centric, uh, and so. I, one, I would say part of it has to do with your location. Um, and so for me, um, in the Northwest, especially we, you may have heard we, we get these, you know, dark, gloomy winters. Um, and so it, we actually, because of our climate, um, we use 10 to 2. Um, more often than not um, on the summer solstice, or excuse me, on the winter solstice. And the reason being is um, the sun is so weak uh, where we're at anyway, most of the times, even 10 to two is a little bit generous. Uh, and I've done some analysis where, um, you know, 11 to one on the solstice, uh, actually the, the overall impact for when you look at it as a whole for the year um, isn't that bad. And so you're able to pack things a little bit tighter. Um, and it's just because the sun, for us, the sun's behind the clouds anyway. So what does it matter if you're shaded up to 11 o'clock? You're gonna be shaded at noon anyway. So what does it matter? Um, so I, all to say a little bit site specific, um, but I think, you know, that nine to three is what I learned as well. And if you're in an off grid situation and you're trying to eke out every last kilowatt hour, by all means, if you're doing a rooftop grid tie system uh, and you're trying to maximize kilowatt hours for the year, um, you're probably gonna wanna go a little bit tighter than that. So it sounds like maybe you can set some sort of rules based on region that make more sense rather than just a blanket rule for the whole country. Yep. Oh, thanks, Randy, for backing me up. <laughs> right, we just got a comment from Randy saying. Yeah. So Randy Bachelor, uh, a buddy of ours who also is does extensive PV system design with Soul Rebel, commented: ten to two is a good starting point and can be more aggressive. Eleven to one works fine in many cases. Depends on the incentive programs too. I've seen 11 to one or even less in a lot of large Northeast ground mounts. All right, so moving on to the, or I guess kind of back to the topic of, of racking. And this is a question that got submitted ahead of time from Thomas Ferringer from EC Powers Life. Um, for flat commercial roofs, what standard racking products are you seeing offered when ballasted systems are not an option, either because of structural concerns or space limitations or AHJ restrictions? And maybe Kate, you can speak to this. Sure, so all of the ballasted systems that we carry do have an option for, um, for mechanical fastening. And, and so I think that that is uh, the, the best thing to do is, is to, if you, if you need, if you're in a situation where you can't use a, use a ballasted system, then your option is to mechanically fasten. And if your AHA will let you get away with it, you, could, you can do a combination, um, like, like a hybrid system. Uh, so I would say work with the AHJ, uh, it's always, and Ryan will back me up on this, it's always good to uh, be friendly uh, when you go into <laughs> an AHJ because they do in the end hold the power and, um, and talk to them about uh, what, what options are out there. What do you approve um, when, you're work, when you have solar on this type of roof and, uh, and see what, what they like to see <laughs> and, and you know, go from there. That's what I would say. And any other thoughts there? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, speaking with them first and foremost, um, it's, I'm gonna give you all my horror stories and it's gonna sound like we're doing, I have nothing but horror stories, but, um, you know, we, we have had somewhere, um, no fault of ours, I would claim, um, but 
uh, after system installation, it was discovered that that the system wasn't going to work for the city, uh, and so it was a start over. So um, asking for forgiveness instead of permission is not the approach to take. Um, and so, yeah, and so to what the standard products are, um, yeah, I would say, you know, these hybrid racking systems, um, combination of ballasted and, and root uh, penetrations, penetrative mounts are probably the best option, the ones that we would always look at first. Uh, and then there's always uh, the options, there's some manufacturers out there that have essentially ground mounts that are um, been modified for mounting up on the roof. Um, your point loading gets much higher. Your uh, the, it, it creates challenges of in of itself, but there are uh, those racking systems. But those are those would be the secondary ones we typically look at, um, and that kind of goes back to that question of relocating vents or going over vents and things like that. Um, yeah, definitely you can go up. Um, it's just going to create more of a structural engineering uh, challenge, I guess you could say, um, but that's always an option as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And that actually answers uh, one of the other questions that came in from Drew Gillette just now of any thought on raising racking above the majority of the obstructions and yeah, you can do it. It's just that now you have, it's more labor intensive. It's more expensive because now you have more um, roof penetrations and additional material. So it seems like those hybrid ballasted racking systems, is that usually because of seismic conditions or is that generally the case where you would have, if you're not allowed to do a fully ballasted system and you have to attach somewhere or are there other conditions where they require a hybrid or partially attached? Um, I would say most, as in my experience, mostly been around um, seismic issues, although we have had up here again, um, I'll stop calling out specific jurisdictions so I don't get myself in trouble. Um, but we have had um, situations where it's for other reasons and it's um, the based on which um, uh, ASCE, um, the civil, the A, the ASC 716, uh, and the racking system you're using, um, it becomes potentially a little more difficult, um, and so uh, that's just also another consideration, especially when you're talking with your AHJs. Uh, you know, how is it that they are doing their calculations or want to see the calculations done? Um, and the the big thing is the interaction of the modules through the racking down to the roof. So can get to, to wind loading too, sorry. Right, there's that. I, I also wanna jump in on the, the raising of the, um, the system above any obstructions is you, you need to consider your fire rating as well uh, because the higher up the system is, the more, if there is a thermal event, uh, the more oxygen is able to get underneath the system, which can, uh, can cause a bigger fire. And if uh, you need a certain classification uh, for the system, class A, class C on the fire rating, um, then th that probably raising it up above uh, the any obstructions might might cause issues there. Yeah, so there's a trade off. There are other sometimes it's a maintenance thing as well, right? If you're wanting access to a particular unit and or the the building owner wants to maintain roof access in certain portions. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so in terms of O and M, what consideration should be taken um, during PD design for difficult roofs? And maybe Emily oh. can speak to to some of the considerations here for O and M. Sure. Um so, so well, one of the considerations following what I've said about MLPE is just streamlining it. If you have a difficult roof um, in terms of accessibility, uh, you want to have that be uh, as simple as possible. Um, as well, uh, my, in my opinion, the best place for an inverter, no matter how robust this inverter is, um, would be on the northern wall at ground level. Um, I, I know that sounds very old school. I do come from I, st I started working in solar in 2007. That's what we said then. Uh, it has changed because of different uh, requirements for rapid shutdown. Um, now, NEC 2017 is requiring 
a module level shutdown. So, wow, like we could bring the inverter back down onto the ground and make it really accessible for an O&M team. Um, as well, um, there's, I mean, it's accessible. And also, I, I know, like we, we talked about thermal events. I mean, it, it takes one of the possibilities, one of the points of failure and puts it down on the ground where it's easier to access. Uh, so so there, there is that. Um, uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and, and if you are to actually want to put an inverter on the roof, that's totally possible. Everything's listed to, to work in that kind of environment. Um, it is more of a, um, like a stringent environment. <laughs> Um, it, you, you're putting your inverter, basically you're lying it down sometimes um, on a sun chair, like getting a tan, sitting there, <laughs> like, you know, like power electronics don't, they don't like that. So if you are going to put it on the roof, um, I would say you want to have it so that the, the angle is as high as you can make it. Um, some of these inverters um, can go down to zero degrees and, and that's great. However, you, you have these um, uh, possibilities of failure when you, when you put it flat. Because when you, when you have conduits going into your wiring box, let's say, for instance, the conduits might put a little bit of weight on that join, and that join is a point of um, weakness later on. Um, more and more time goes, and you might have a great install team. They might have no space initially between the, like, that, that join of the conduit and your wiring box. But then once, once uh, you know, time happens, shifting and weight happen, you're going to have a little bit of a weakness there. And if the inverter is lying down flat and there's no place for the water to go, you have water ingress, which leads more to more thermal vent possibilities. So you want to avoid that. Um, you always want to think about O&M of your, um, well, for me, it's, inverters because that's that's where I work that's where I live um, we do have like a new inverter that is super small and lightweight um, the PVI 25 TL and that weighs like 48 pounds so like you could put that in a backpack and like climb a ladder and get it up there but if you have like a larger inverter that requires some kind of lifting um, capability that's that's when you want to think about taking this inverter and putting it down um, other things to think about are, well, fire safety, you always have to think about that. So you want to consider uh, quality components and brands you trust. So I know like, and I don't know how many people have seen my, my meme of like, you know, those, those three people and like, um, the guy is looking back at this, this new hot chick and holding a hand of his girlfriend, like, do not look at the cheapest priced component <laughs> like don't always choose like don't always go for that cheap um component uh you you've got to choose brands that you trust quality quality workmanship um that's going to lead to less o and problems later on um and sometimes you have to think about like what brands will be there later on um it, it's really cool sometimes when like new companies come out with innovative designs and um, you know, and, and that's, it's great. Like we need to push our, our industry further and further. However, sometimes these brands come out with these new, new technologies and they're not there to service your equipment. And then it's, they have such unique um, setups that you can't fix it with any other product. So things to think about there um, and I guess like voltages, you'll have to think about VMP and making sure that you're stringing it right. If you're using a string inverter, uh, making sure that it's not too low, um, because modules always degrade over time. Yeah, that brings up a great yeah, point like of module manufacturer or any equipment manufacturer of really evaluating, like, are they going to be around in time and what's the level of their tech support, not just what's the price. Um, yeah. And so, uh, uh, one question slash comment came in back to rapid shutdown and, and sunspec. Uh, so this came in from Joe Pizer and sorry if I butcher your name, but thanks for being here and submitting a question. I, so he says, I thought the idea of sunspec 
is that there was a universal standard so that each manufacturer doesn't have to have their own specific RSD device uh, that only works with their components. But I hear you're saying each has their own system and that there is no universal standard per se that doesn't guarantee that everything's going to work together. So is that accurate? Yeah, that's 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 my question as well, Joe. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, we worked so hard on the standard, and it's it's so disappointing to hear that um, the receivers are not. Um, you know, universal and, and stuff like that. But every, every MLP has different things that they also provide. Um, so the standard is to shut down, right? But then you have MLPs that are going to give you monitoring information or te like, temp like temperature information. Um, they might have um, optimization. So like all these things are going through. And so if you have, um, and they might need like a transmitter to tell them certain things. Um, so, so yeah, I, well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, Joe. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Well, yeah, that's just confusing and, and misleading, to be honest, for a consumer or for an installer who thinks like, oh, this should work. It has a certification. And then when you dig di deeper into it, that's not actually the case. So good. Yeah, I all hope, great I hope tips. I'll move towards that. Mm-hmm having a more robust standard that covers all the different functionality. Yeah, that would be great. So on to the next question. And this one came in ahead of time from David Carboneau from Ideal Energies. And he was asking, and I think this one, Kate, is gonna go to you. He's asking, how do you work with roof manufacturers who are opposed to ballasted solar installations on their roofs? So specifically a built up roof, tar and gravel, where there isn't a slip sheet similar to EPDM or, TP or TPO roofs. What are common rebuttals um, to their concerns or, or how, do you, how do you go about that? How do you deal with that? Well, I, in my... In my experience, it's it's often best to go in with a uh, a, 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 a an attitude of curiosity uh, to talk to uh, the manufacturer directly and and ask you know what 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 is are the specific concerns and and how have you seen these dealt with in the past? Is there is there a method that we can uh, use to to help uh, satisfy your concerns. Um, I and I think it's always always important to work with uh, a roofer, uh, someone who who understands uh, the roof itself. Roofs are are systems. It's not just shingles or just a layer of metal or tiles. It is an entire system. Uh, that protects the interior of, of the building. And, and unless you understand that entire system, uh, then, then it's, it's pretty easy to make mistakes. Um, I, uh, with flat roofs, there are a lot of things to consider um, uh, as far as drainage and um, you know, being able to, to, to penetrate through the, the roof membrane, what, what's going to be required there. Um, so I, I, would, I would say talk to the roof uh, uh, manufacturer, um, be, be curious <laughs> and not uh, demanding. And, and the same goes with a roofer. Um, and, if, and if you can form a good relationship with a roofer who, who can back you up, and um, and is able to to help out with some of those conversations. Uh, I think that 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 it just brings uh, more benefit uh, to the situation. Yeah, always good to be curious and have a have a better understanding of where the other person's coming from. And I find that to be true in lots of different conversations, not with just <laughs> with talking to <laughs> roofers or roof manufacturers, but sometimes someone will have a gut reaction to something and just say like, no, or have this opinion. And, and if you take a moment to just ask, well, what do you mean by that? And then when they start explaining, you start to realize that, oh, actually you have, you know, you're more aligned in your thinking and thought process than you thought. And once you dive into it. Yep. 
Yeah, so kind of related again to roof layouts, and this question came in from Hamilton Hutchinson live just now. Thanks, Hamilton, for submitting and engaging with us. What is your approach for new construction sites um, where the design is currently is in design or in construction for the entire building and the roof equipment locations are constantly changing. So say you have a, a hotel and there's dozens of vent stacks and solar isn't given a designated space. So you're having to uh, design a system, the electrical and interconnection scope while the roof is essentially a moving target. How do you, how do you go about dealing with that situation? My, my personal, like what we, the way we approach it as we're doing designs, um, new construction is always going to take more time. I, there's just, uh, in terms of on the design side. Um, and so for, you know, to lack of a better way of saying it, um, there's basically a new construction charge. Um, and the reason is, is exactly what Hamilton was saying. There's um, things are going to change on the roof. Um, architects going to change their mind. Um, something's going to change interior that's going to make its way up to the roof where, where an RTU is going to be. Um, and it's not always possible to, to know all those, th all those things. And so um, quite honestly, the, the best approach that we found is just al allocating yourself more time and not and just knowing it's going to change uh and just as much as you can whoever are those decision makers on what's going to happen that's going to affect the roof um you know just let them know early in the process you know if there's certain goals if they're trying to do a lead um, they have some lead points they're trying to get after or something like that um you know there's you know finding out what those goals are and just you know, just trying to get them to understand what the what your needs are going to be as far as the the PV installation goes, um, but quite honestly, it's just allocating more time because it's going to come up and it's going to happen. Uh, and new construction is great for, on the installation side. On the design side, it's much more difficult. Uh, quite honestly. Yeah. So just baking, knowing that there that is going to happen, and baking that into yeah. how you're quoting new system or yeah. new building construction, new construction. New construction. Yeah. Yeah, that's good to know. Well, we are approaching the end of the hour and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I just wanted to say I'm so happy we we're able to do this because this was originally supposed to be an SPI panel session and then SPI didn't happen. So <laughs> we just did our own little panel session. Yeah, so I just want to thank you again to Emily and uh, and Kate for participating and doing this with us and sharing your expert knowledge. We just love having you and, and we hope to have you again. Yes, and, thank, you. thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we wanna let you know that we are doing this monthly. So our next AMA session is gonna be November 17th, just before the holidays. And we're gonna be talking about solar plus energy storage uh, system design. So join us for that and we'll be picking Justine Sanchez's brain. So we're very excited about that. Also, we did record this session. So in case you wanna go back and re-listen to some of the responses that Kate and Emily and Ryan gave, we will be posting this on our YouTube channel and you can review that. And with that, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today and we look forward to seeing you again. Great. And Definitely. reach out to us. Uh, reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions. That's all our contact info. And yeah. All right. Thanks for for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Okay. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye.